They were a team of whores, and Magic was the biggest whore. Not just on the team, the biggest whore I'd ever seen. He loved women, two, three at a time. One day, we were on a road trip and I asked him, when the hell do you sleep? Do you ever sleep? We'd show up at a hotel in a new city, and there'd be two or three women specifically waiting for him. He'd sleep with them, then kick them out. At shoot around later in the day, there'd be two or three more girls. He'd sleep with them. Irvin didn't drink, and Irvin didn't smoke, and Irvin didn't touch drugs. His vice was women. Ron Carter. The Showtime Los Angeles Lakers. A cast of individuals who composed one of the most electrifying demonstrations of dominance on the hardwood throughout the entirety of the 80s. As still to this day, 40 years removed from their dawn, you cannot mention the greatest teams in NBA history without mentioning the greatest period for one of the league's most iconic franchises. Since during their decade atop the NBA world, the Lakers will go on to capture five NBA championships while at the same time capturing the hearts and demanding respect from basketball fans across the globe. Though, while their achievements on the court are rivaled by a few, their achievements off the court are rivaled by even fewer. As the Rockstar lifestyle, in which many members of the team lived, revealed that the Rockstar lifestyle isn't exclusively for rock stars. This is especially apparent when taking a look at Magic Johnson, aka the captain, director, and choreographer of the unparalleled spectacle that took place at the Forum in Inglewood, California. Okay, so in part one of a series I did called The Dark Side of Showtime, we took an in-depth look at Magic Johnson and some of the other key figures that helped to make Showtime, Showtime. And as unbelievable as some of the things regarding Magic and the Lakers sounded, it was all true. Well, most of it. See, I did get a couple of things wrong here or there, whether it be calling the forum in which the team played the Staples Center or accrediting a couple of quotes to Michael Cooper instead of the person who really set them and Ron Carter. For the most part, all of the information that I used in that video was taken straight from the source, straight from the mouths of the players who experienced it all firsthand. The ups, the downs, the parties, the women, the drugs. Over time, all of it simply became commonplace for most who were associated with the team. Like I said though, we touched on all of that back in the three part series I did on the dark side of Showtime earlier on in the year. I'll have the links to those videos down in the description box below if you want to check them out. However, in this video, what we're going to be taking at is actually how it all came to an end. How the empire that took a decade to build came crashing down overnight. Welcome to the end of Showtime. Larry Bird and Magic Johnson, two names that have been intertwined in the eyes of history. For you will never hear one mentioned without the other due to the nature and intensity of their hotly contested rivalry a rivalry that was truly unlike any other rivalry in the history of the game. For two individuals who seemed to be from completely opposing backgrounds, turned out to be a lot more similar than anyone could ever imagine. As throughout their life of trying to obtain their own definition of success, it was almost always the other who stood in their way. Whether it be their meeting in the 1979 NCAA championship game, or their three meetings in the NBA finals that they had throughout the course of the 80s. Matt Johnson's story would not be completed without Larry Bird, nor would Larry Bird's be completed without Magic Johnson. They were, and still are, the definition of a faded rivalry. However, unlike other rivalries that the game has seen, where two players start off as friends until their rivalry eventually gets the better of their friendship, for Bird and Johnson, it was the opposite, as the players who always desperately tried to one-up the other on a nightly basis eventually formed an unbreakable bond that was forged by the battles that they shared, with the base of that bond being an exorbitant amount of respect held for the other. Now. Of course, Larry Bird wasn't the only person Magic shared a bond with during his playing days, as another player who Magic once called a friend was two-time NBA champion and 12-time All-Star, Isaiah Thomas. We had an incredible friendship. We used to do everything together back in the day. And then that kind of faded. Isaiah Thomas, like was stated in that quote, he and Magic Johnson once shared a bond as well. Magic, who was from the same rural Michigan roots in which Isaiah now called home, even considered him to be one of his closest confidants a friend in which he could truly trust. And for Isaiah, Magic was someone he could turn to after his dream of reaching the NBA Finals was halted by Larry Bird and the Celtics year after year, as Isaiah would regularly call Magic to vent and grieve after being eliminated from the playoffs. After all, at the time they were united by a common enemy, since more than anything, neither wanted to lose to Larry Bird and the Boston Celtics. And that is why Magic decided to let him know first, why he decided to tell Isaiah Thomas 
Larry Bird, and former teammates Michael Cooper and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar before anyone else. That through his promiscuous life, he had contracted HIV. First of all, let me say good, a good after late afternoon. Um, because of uh, the HIV virus that I have attained, uh, I will have to retire from the Lakers uh, today. This day, the world at large was thought to have lost a legend. As far as most were concerned, Matt Johnson's public announcement of the virus was simply him letting everyone know that he was going to die. My God, Magic's gonna die. Those are the words that Larry Bird uttered to his wife as he tried not to topple over in disbelief after his phone call with Magic. All of a sudden, all of the games played, all of the points scored, championships won. They all seemed meaningless now that his rival, his counterpart, his friend, was handed a death sentence. And while Bird did indeed show signs of empathy towards his friend's plight, the person the Magic considered to be one of, if not his closest friend in the league, took the news as an opportunity to stab him in the back. I keep hearing Magic's gay. Those words from Isaiah Thomas pierced like a sword through the very soul of Magic, as once again, the person he thought he was the closest to in the NBA was now the person questioning and spreading false rumors about the entire situation. And I guess maybe you could say in Thomas's defense that at the time, there was a preconceived notion that only gay people got AIDS. But still, regardless of what people thought about the virus at the time, publicly questioning the sexuality of someone who considered you a close friend after they were diagnosed with a potentially life-threatening condition may not have been a good move for anyone who truly valued that friendship, as after this, the bond that they once shared was severed, with Magic's wife Cookie saying that out of everything that happened to him during that time period, what Isaiah did and said hurt Magic more than anything else. And though he may have hurt Magic the most, Isaiah Thomas wasn't the only person who started treating Magic differently after his diagnosis, since even Magic's own teammates began trying to keep their distance. Most thought even getting his sweat on them could be enough to transfer the virus. Still, despite the new fears surrounding one of the icons of the league at the time, it was made clear after Magic was forced into retirement that the NBA world might not have been quite ready for Mr. Showtime to pack his bags just yet, as the flashiness and pizzazz that Johnson brought to the game was still something that fans craved to see on a nightly basis. No one wanted this to be the end. People still wanted to believe in Magic, which is why despite being officially retired during the 1991-1992 NBA season, millions of people worldwide still voted for him to start in the 1992 NBA All-Star Game, a decision by the fans to put a lot of pressure on the league's executives. What do you do? Do you give in to the fans, give them what they want in a move that will almost guarantee a great turnout and ratings on television? Or do you play it safe and not allow Magic to participate out of fear that the virus within him is contracted by another player on the court? The obvious answer for then Commissioner David Stern, you roll the dice, you believe in Magic. Magic Johnson, who had not played a single game that regular season, was going to start in the All-Star game. And as popular as this decision by Stern was amongst the fans who voted for him, the same can't be said about a majority of players who were set to participate in the weekend's main event. Most of the players were terrified of sharing the core with Magic, and some thought it was disrespectful of Magic to accept the invitation to play in the game as it took away a spot from players who actually played during the season and deserved to be there. The animosity that some players held for Johnson over this was so great in fact, they tried to go behind his back to get him out of the game. The main individual being 12-time All-Star, Karl Malone. Look at this. Scabs and cuts all over me. I get these every night, every game. They can't tell you that you're not at risk. And you can't tell me there's one guy in the NBA who hasn't thought about it. Yeah, Malone in particular did not want Johnson playing. Granted, that comment by Malone wasn't made to protest Magic playing in the 92 All-Star game. But instead, that comment was made by Malone after Magic Johnson won MVP of that All-Star game and also helped the Dream Team claim the gold medal in the Olympics that same summer. Just because he came back doesn't mean nothing to me. I'm no fan, no cheerleader. It may be good for basketball, but you have to look far beyond that. You have to look at young men who have a long life ahead of them. The Dream Team was a concept everybody loved. But now we're back to reality. And that reality to people with the same mindset as Karl Malone was that it was unfair for Magic to be allowed to come out of retirement. 
After all, how many other players out there not named Michael Jordan or Magic Johnson or Larry Bird would the NBA let return with such a serious and potentially hazardous condition? Not many. David Stern, though, was not going to let complaints about the player who alongside Bird saved the NBA prevent him from coming back to the league, which is why despite the protests that were held by players to get Johnson banned, Stern allowed him to return anyways. Yep, one year after retiring, Magic was back. Sadly though, his return wouldn't be as triumphant as the world would have liked to have seen. As while the Lakers were taking on the Cleveland Cavaliers during a preseason game, Magic received a cut on his right arm. The outcome of the cut being all were in attendance of the game, letting out an audible gasp. Fans in the crowd were holding their breath, almost as if they were expecting the game to be canceled, while players on the court immediately distanced themselves from Magic and were skeptical as to whether or not the game should continue as well. Following new protocols that have been initiated due to the rise of HIV and AIDS, a mandatory timeout was called in order to patch up the open wound. Gary Vitti, the chief medical officer for the Lakers, walked over to Johnson with a bandage to cover the cut. As he reached for the gloves in his back pocket, which were required to be used in these type of situations, he noticed all of the other players for the Lakers were watching him to see what he would do. After all, he had been the one who assured them that they had nothing to fear when it came to magic, that their odds of dying in a tragic car accident far outweighed their odds of contracting Magic's case of HIV. So with that being the case, he made the conscious decision to forego wearing the gloves and instead just slap the bandaid on Magic. Though by this time, the damage had already been done. Magic Johnson, the player who was accustomed to receiving nothing but oohs and ahs from sold out crowds throughout his career, had been deeply affected by the gaps that he heard in their place. He was also affected by the cold stares of the other players who used to hold him in the highest esteem. Magic Johnson now felt like an outsider in the very league that he helped to create. And for Magic, these feelings were more than he could bear. Cookie, it's over. I'm not going to hurt the league Larry and I spent so much time building up. The weekend after his demoralizing experience against the Cavaliers, Magic's agent and the Lakers both announced to the rest of the world that though he had been cleared by the league to play once again, that the curtains were closing for the man who brought the world showtime. Magic Johnson had left the building taking with him the end of one of the greatest 10-year periods in all of sports history.